Praise the Lord. I hope you decided to follow Jesus. Amen. And I know, I remember when I got saved and it wasn't long, my friends started kind of fading away and didn't want to hang out much anymore. And I wasn't mean to, I wasn't rude. I didn't say, you know, I didn't say, well, listen, I'm a believer now. I'm a born again believer. And I don't do those things anymore. They knew right off. They knew right away there was something different about me. And I give all the glory and credit for the Lord. Amen. So go with me in your Bible to Luke chapter number 8. And I wanted to give this message uh, for Brad. Amen. And not only that, but believers, you all need to hear this as well. And this is a refresher and a, and a good uh, lesson on how we need to grow in the good ground. Amen. So it's a lesson tonight on how we should grow and how we can grow in the good ground. So if you go to Luke chapter number 8, verses 4 through verse number 15, the Lord here is speaking of the parable. This is the parable of the sower and the seed. I'm going to go through here, and I'm going to explain to you uh, what these four different soils are and what they represent and uh, what they do produce. Amen? If you found your place, say amen. amen. Verse number 4 says this, And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city. Here's what the Bible said. He spake by a parable. And this parable says this. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trotted down. And the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up. It withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And, and others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. But look here in verse number 9. And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? And he said, unto, he said unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, and here's where the Lord explains what the parable means. He said, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Verse 13, They on the rocks are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when... They have heard, they go forth, and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. That word perfection in the Bible means completion. Amen? But verse number 15 says this, But they that, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, look here, keep it. I'm going to explain that here in, in the message. And bring forth fruit with patience. So this evening I want to show you how we all can grow in that good ground. We find four different grounds represented. We find the wayside. We find the stony ground. We find the thorny ground. And then we find the good ground. And we see the typology of the sower. The sower, we see the typology of the seed. And we see the typology of the soil. First of all, the sower is God. Our Lord sows the seed in all types of ground, giving everyone the opportunity to be saved. And we see here that one-fourth of those who hear the Word of God will refuse to receive it. Secondly, the seed is the Word of God. As the Word of God spreads throughout the wor world, many will not receive it properly. Thirdly, the soil is us. God sows the seed in us so we can grow spiritually in good ground. But it's sad to see that two-thirds of those who witness God sowing the seed fall on them with will not fully receive His grace. 
So how do we grow in the good ground? I want to show you three things, and I'm done. We'll baptize. First of all, I'm going to show you in verse number 5. Hold your place in Luke chapter 8. But look here in verse number 5. The Bible said, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, the Bible said here, Some fell by the wayside. And it was trotted down. And look here. And the fowls of the air, the Bible says, devoured it. What I find here, in order for us to grow in the good ground, that we must be receptive to God. We have to be in tune to what God is telling us, especially through the Word of God. We have to be receptive to what God has for us. Again, the Bible said that, that the sower went out to see. Who's the sower? What did what, what I say in the introduction? The sower is God. And we find that God is sowing the seed, and the seed that being the Word of God. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a sower. Anybody ever seen a sower sowing seed? The, it, it, they, he takes a bag and he's got a satchel. He's got a bag. And he's got a bag full of seed and he's literally just throwing the seed out upon the ground. And again, we see that, that God is sowing the Word of God amongst multiple different uh, uh, types of ground. And wherever that seed may fall, that's what the Bible's mentioned here. And some fell amongst the wayside here. Because look, jump with me to verse number 12. And the Bible says, And those by the wayside are they that hear. Listen to this. Then cometh what? The devil. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the words out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. That's before salvation. You hear the word, you hear it preached, you understand it to be preached, but the Bible said the devil comes and he'll steal it right out of your heart. Here's what he said. That ain't true. Right? Here's what the devil said. That's old time religion. We don't need that anymore. Here's what the devil says. That's traditionalism. You don't need that anymore. Here's what the devil said. The word of God is a lie and it's been translated over and over and over and over by men. How many have ever heard that? The devil tell you that. By the way, he's done that since the beginning of time. Because I want to draw your attention back to Genesis chapter number 3. Oh, Eve is talking to the serpent. That's always amazed me, folks. She wasn't scared of a snake. You know, that tells me that was over a period of time that she was conversating with the, with the devil, with the serpent, right? She was comfortable to talking to him and then argued against him. But what did he say? Did God really say that? That's what he said. And, and so the devil will come and he'll put doubt in your heart. He'll put the seed of doubt... And as the Bible said, the sower sowed upon the wayside. You see, the wayside, listen to this, or the hardened path represents a closed mind. A closed mind. And there's three causes for some to go by the wayside. Number one is fear. The Bible said, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. How many know somebody like that? Always on the run, always looking around. Always, always hiding out. Listen, if you've done nothing wrong, why are you hiding? Adam and Eve the same way. God was saying, Adam, Adam, where art thou? You know, God didn't lose Adam, right? But God wanted Adam to see where Adam was. And, and Adam was hiding himself. And when he spoke to the Lord, he said, Well, I hid myself because I was naked. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Let me tell you something. You don't, nobody's got to tell you you're a sinner. Nobody's got to tell you you've done wrong. Listen, if you're hiding from someone, or if you're hiding from something, or if you're hiding from God, listen, you're in the wrong, and you know it. You know it. When I was working in the prison, I only met a few, a few guilty men. There's some of them tell you, oh, I'm guilty. I did what I did, and I'm here for it. But there's some like, oh, the system's against me. I did nothing wrong. Well, so tell me what happened. Well, it's a long story. Don't have time to tell you. Well, you're hiding. Amen? I, I met a fellow there. He was from 
East Africa. And he still had that African accent. Every real nice older fella, you know, gray-haired old old uh, uh, black man, and he was just so nice. And he knew the word of God. He loved God. He was there for church service. He was there for Bible study. He was amen to me the whole way. And listen, I finally had to ask him. I said, "Sir, why in the world? How did you end up in a place like this?" He said, "I killed my wife." He said, preacher, I'm guilty. I'll tell you I'm guilty. He said, I'll stand before God for it. But right now, I'm telling you, I'm guilty. I killed my wife. I was in a rage, and I choked her to death. I thought, whoa. Uh -oh. <laughs> but listen there. What I'm trying to say is, is that fear. You know, most people, they'll not receive Christ. They'll not get tuned in. They'll not be receptive to God because of fear. A fear, maybe God won't accept them. A fear, maybe they've done too much. A fear of maybe they've gone too far. There's fear. Number two in that, bitterness. Rubber meets the road here, y'all. How many of you got bitterness in your heart? Let's be honest. There's bitterness. Let me tell you something about bitterness, and I've had to learn this. Bitterness is the only chemical that destroys its own container. Right? You can take in, in, in chemistry, you can bottle any type of acid, you can bottle bleach, you can bottle any other chemical, listen, and, and that container will hold it. But bitterness, when it seeds in your heart and it gets within you, it'll destroy you, it'll destroy your family, it'll destroy your career, and it'll destroy everything about you because you're bitter at something or at somebody else. And let me tell you something, that something or somebody else is, a, is eating steak in the middle of, uh, at 8 o'clock at night. And you're sitting there eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Huh? You say, what do you mean? That's the way I was. Bitter, angry at a preacher. Bitter and angry at what he did to me, what he did to my family. I was angry. I was bitter. You can ask Angel. I'm fighting, fist fighting this guy in the middle of the night. You ask her. She's dodging it. What in the world are you doing? I'm fighting him in the middle of the night in my sleep. And it was one night, listen, it was one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, God woke me up and He said, Do you think that man's losing sleep over you? No, he's not. And he's eating steak every night. And you're having a hard time by putting food on your family's table. We had to go to the food bank just to put food on our table during that time because I was angry, I was mad, I was ready to get back at him. That's a fact. Let me tell you, I think it's been long enough I can confess this now, but you know what I was going to do? I was going to become a cop. I was going to move back to Oklahoma City, and I was going to join the police academy. I was going to be a cop. I knew where every one of those folks in that church lived. I knew where that preacher lived. I knew what he, dro what he drove. And I was going to get back at every one of them. You know what? That's what bitterness does to you. And it took a long time. You asked Miss Angel, it took a long time for me to get over that. Because it was destroying us. It was destroying, it was destroying our family, it was destroying everything. And maybe bitterness, maybe bitterness is, you're having an issue with bitterness. The Bible says, and, and if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it is earthly, it's sensual, and the Bible says it's devilish. How about pride? Number three, pride. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness and engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Pride. Pride. When my son, we, he left the mission field and came to the United States, joined the Navy. I'm telling you, I even called the Navy recruiter from Ireland. He's like, he thought it was a joke. He said, this can't be real. And one day, uh, my son showed up right there at the recruitment office. And he thought, well, I guess it was real. He was recruited, but there was a time they could not officially put him in. He was recruited. He was their responsibility. But there was a period of time they could not officially swear him in. So there was about a year he was in Georgia living with this person and living with this family and living with that family. I think he was with three different families and he was kicked out of every one of them's home. And the reason why was because of his pride. 
And I called him one day. I got a call from uh, a family that we had at a church in Georgia. And by the way, they were doing it not for him, but they were doing it because they loved us. And I told him, I said, listen, you're burning bridges other people have built because of your pride. Got a call one day, and, and it was uh, Darlene. She called me. She said, I don't know what to do with him. I don't want to kick him out. I don't want to do with him. You call him. So I called him on a cell phone, which we had got him a cell phone so we can keep in contact. And, and he's walking down the street somewhere in Atlanta, Georgia. I said, you need to turn around and go back to the house and apologize. No, Dad. He said, I have my pride. I said, let me tell you something about your pride. I said, that pride isn't going to get you anywhere in the Navy. Huh? I said, that pride you're talking about, people don't want to work with that. People don't want to associate with that. That pride is not going to get you anywhere in this world. Because you got your pride. I said, suck up your pride and get back there and apologize. No. I said, we'll see where this pride gets you. Well, I think he walked a little further and realized <laughs> he needed to go back. He got some things right. But listen, pride, listen to me, pride. If you have pride in your heart, you're not receptive to God. If you have fear and if you have bitterness and you have pride in your heart, listen to me, that seed is going by the wayside and the devil is by ease taking that out of your heart. Amen. You know, the devil, devil doesn't do things... Let me tell you, the devil don't have new tricks. Here's what he uses. Three things he uses. He don't use anything else but these three things. And let me tell you the reason why he still uses these three things because they work every time. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. They work. And that's what he'll use against you. You see, we have to be tuned in. We have to be receptive to God. Number two, look at verse six. And the Bible said, And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Hey, we don't have to tell you. If we go out there and I tell you to pick up, uh, to pull the, the weeds out of the, the rock bed out there, it's with ease, isn't it? No problem. We'll pull the leaves out because you know why? Because there's no root. It lacks moisture. And what we have to do in order for us to grow in the good ground, not only do we have to be receptive to God, but number two, we have to be resolved to grow. How many of us tonight, we're just, we're saved. But we ain't growing. Because we lacked moisture. We lacked a root. You, how many of you have seen families maybe in the past that just seems like every, just a little bit of a wind or a storm that's come in their life has completely blown them out of church? It's completely, they're gone. You know why? Because there's no root. It's no different than you take a tree. Listen, these trees out here, as far as I know, Miss Peggy, they've been here for over 50 years. These big oak trees. There's been hurricane winds come through. There's been uh, different winds. Look, I'll go out there and pick up the limbs, but the trees are still there. Why is that? Because they have roots. But you take a little old apple tree out there. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? A little apple tree don't have much roots. They have shallow roots. Although the fruit is good, although the fruit is beautiful, although the fruit is useful, but they lack root. And you take a little bit of wind or you take the hurricane wind and that apple tree will come down. I was out there Friday picking up limbs with Lane and Gabriel and Lane picks up an acorn. He goes, Pop, Pop, what's this? And it was about that big. I said, that's an acorn. He said, can I eat it? I said, only the squirrels eat it. That big mighty oak Produce fruit about that big. But let me tell you something. There's longevity in that. You may tell yourself in your life, well, I'm not bearing much fruit. Or I'm not, I don't have, uh, you know, but small fruit. But it, where's your root? You see, your fruit is, ex is affected by the root. Amen. And I heard uh, Adrian Rogers say this. I can't, I can't claim this on my own, y'all. But I heard Adrian Rogers say this. He said, the fruit 
grows on the edge of the limb. And he said, in life, in order for you to bear fruit, you've got to go out on a limb. That slapped me like right between the eyes. I thought, man, that's good. I'm going to tell Robert. I said, hey, Robert, I was at your house, didn't I? Right after that. I said, Robert, let me tell you something. Boy, I got a revelation from God. Amen. Hey, you're talking about the fruit. He said, yeah, I heard Adrian Rogers say the same thing. I went, ah, I can't claim that. Right? I said, I'm trying to claim it. He goes, no, Adrian Rogers done said it. He stole it. But then he preached that like in the 1970s or something, you know. Before I was even born, he was saying that. But in order for us to grow in the good ground, listen, we've got to be resolved to grow. You see, that rocky ground or that shallow soil represents a superficial or superficial commitment. A commitment that is shallow and has no depth. You see, we ought to be good examples. We have to be committed examples. The Bible said, be you doers of the word and not hearers only. And what's the rest of the verse say? Deceiving your own selves. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said, if you're not doers of the word and you're hearers only, you're just deceiving yourself. What's happening? There's no root. What's happening? You have a superficial commitment. What's happening? There's no depth. And your Christianity. You've got to grow. You have to be examples. Not only that, but you've got to be committed to exercise. Hey, Amen. I was telling Robert earlier, I said, look, my foot's starting to feel a little bit better. We're fixing to go run. We're not run, but we're going to walk. This, this preacher, listen, this preacher don't run, but to the bathroom. You'll get that in a minute. I have never seen or ever understood or comprehend what was so fun about running. I was like, well, I ran 10 miles out. That means you got to run 10 miles back. <laughs> Same way with biking. Well, we biked 10 miles out. That means you got to bike 10 miles back. I never understood that. But I told them we we're going to exercise, didn't we? Didn't I? And that's what we have to do in our faith. Just like anything else, fellas, if you want to keep that muscle toned, you've got to work it. If you want to, Roger, if you want to keep that, those joints are moving, that motion is lotion. You've got to keep moving. I found out the other day, Roger walks up two miles, what, you do two miles a day? A mile down? A mile down and a mile back. He said, I'm, 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 I'm going to keep exercise. You have to. If you don't exercise, listen, if you don't exercise that body, what happens to it? If you don't use it, you lose it. And see, the, we have to exercise. The Bible says, but refuse profane and old wives' tales, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Five ways to commit an example and, and commit and, and to be exercised. Number one is this, commit to connect with others. Fellowship, fellas. Ladies, fellowship. Ladies, we have prayer meeting at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Fellowship. Connect with others. Great way to get involved. We'll go out and knock on doors. Well, preacher, I'm not good at that. You don't have to do a thing. Just go with me. Robert will tell you right now. Robert's got to tell he got to kind of push me out of the way so he can get up there on the porch, don't you? And I'll go, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I have the tendency to take all the doors. Robert's like, I got this one. Yeah. But that's a great way to get involved. Go out soul winning with us. Hey, connect with others. Go out, invite others to church. Listen to me. God will give you the opportunity to witness. God will give you the opportunity to invite others to church. You could ask Robert tonight. He's waiting on filling his bottled water, and he started talking to some people and invited them to church, gave them a track. And what did they tell you? Looking We're looking for a church. See, if we want to grow, you have to exercise your faith. You have to try to commit to connect with others. Not only that, but connect, con commit to build spiritual habits. Get in the habit of reading God's Word every day, even if it's a verse. That's why I send out those verses 
by text message. I'm going to get your uh, number, uh, Brad. We're going to send you every morning. I'll send out a verse of Scripture by text message. I know. <laughs> Timmy, hey, if I ain't doing it by 8 o'clock, Timmy's like, I didn't get my verse. <laughs> Amen. But if, even if it's one verse of Scripture... Commit yourself. Get in the Word of God. Commit yourself in spiritual habits. That's going to church. Amen? That's praying. That's getting around godly men. And ladies getting around godly ladies. Fellowship. Connect. Exercise. Build spiritual habits. Listen to me. We all got habits, don't we? Hello? Y'all don't look super sanctimonial. Don't look all uh, pious over there. Amen? And here's the thing. When you have a habit or a vice or an addiction, listen to me, you always trade that addiction for something else. Right? Say you're trying to quit smoking. What do you do? You pick up something else that's usually just as bad, if not worse. Vaping. Y'all stop that vaping. I don't think anybody in this church is vaping. But listen, that vaping will quit, kill you quicker than that tobacco. Here's what happens. That oil that they're puffing on, that they're sucking on, it builds up in their lungs. And they start coughing it up. That's the truth. I dealt with that in Northern Ireland. These young teenagers of vaping. And let me tell you something about that vaping. In comparison to cigarettes. Y'all know some chain smokers, right? I mean, it's like, preacher, every time I turn around, they got a cigarette in their mouth, right? And that's not good. But you watch those that are vaping never leaves their lips. They'll puff on that vape more than the average person puffs on a cigarette. And see, when you have one addiction or you have one habit, you always replace it with something else. So when you have a habit you know you're supposed to break, replace it with something spiritual. Amen. You having a bad day? Go soul win it. Right? But I tell you what, the old devil works on you. Uh, we dealt with that in Ireland, you know. Oh, uh, why weren't you in church? I was in a bad form. Well, that's when you need to be in church. Why weren't we out going out knocking on doors? Where you been? Well, I was in a bad form, just in a bad mood, preacher. I don't think I need to be out telling people about Jesus when I'm in a bad mood. That's going to get you in a better mood. Because God's going to put you in front of a door when things are going a whole lot worse on the other side of that door than what you're dealing with. So you need to, again, exercise. What is this? You need to start uh, connecting with others, build spiritual habits. How about use your talents for the Lord? Well, preacher, I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to play the piano. I don't know how to sing. Neither do I. But let me tell you something. You've got an ability you can use for the Lord. You know how to cut grass? You know how to paint? Huh? I was looking at the outside of this building. We've got to paint the outside of this building this, this spring. That's it. You can, you can, can you pick up a brush and do this? You have the ability. You have a talent you can use for the Lord. Do you know how to build? Are you good with construction? Hey, I'm wanting to do some things around the church. We can do that. Huh? Use your talents. Maybe you're good with people. You can use your talent with the Lord. Number four, commit to share your faith with others. Here's where a lot of people struggle. Well, preacher, I just don't know the Bible well enough to witness to somebody. Well, preacher, I just don't know the Romans road to heaven. No, you, you don't need to know that. All you have to do is tell them your story, how you got saved. That's it. You know, we all have different stories, but the same outcome. So again, you have to commit. You have to commit to share your faith and also commit to fulfill your purpose in life. Number three, and I'm done. I'm going to put two of them into one. Number one is this. What? We have to be receptive to God, right? The seed falls on the wayside. The devil comes and steals it out of their heart. Number two, the, uh, you must be resolved to grow. And the Bible said it fell upon the, the, the rocks and it sprang up and it withered away because it lacked moisture. 
had no depth. And then number three, we must be ruthless with distractions. I'm going to look at that third ground here and then I'm going to wrap it up. Look at verse 7. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up with it. And the Bible says it did what? Choked it. You know, every time the Bible mentions thorns, that's always a type or in reference to the fall of man. That's always a type and a reference to the curse. Because before the fall of man, there was no thorns. And because of the fall of man, because sin, or, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The Bible says that the ground itself was cursed, and it sprang forth thorns and thistles. And if we're not careful, we'll, uh, the, the, the seed, it'll fall upon the thorny ground. And what that is, that's that crowded life. That's that life that begins to choke the believer. Things get busy, don't they? Huh? And if we're not careful, we're going to allow certain things in our life to choke us. And, and that we will not have the ability or, or have the, the opportunity to grow in the Lord because they begin to choke us and they begin to crowd us. And what we have to be is we have to be ruthless with distractions. Let me all tell you something. I don't understand. I was telling Angel the other day. Why is it they never have any of the ball games or the practices or, or the fun things for kids on Tuesday or Thursday? Why has it always got to be Wednesday? You see, folks, we have to be ruthless with those distractions. Why is it, hey, hey let's, let's be real. Why is it that the good sitcoms come on Wednesday night? Well, I want to watch that Wednesday night. We have to be ruthless with distractions. And so those thorns that come up and they begin to choke us. You see, the thorns represents the weeds that were given during the fall and the curse of man. And here's what the Bible says about the thorns in verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And the Bible says, and they bring no fruit to perfection. If we're not careful, we'll allow our careers to choke us. We'll allow our finances and our debt to choke us us and will not serve God as we should because we want the cares and the riches and the glory and all the comforts of the world. They've choked us. We've knocked on enough doors and we've talked, right, Robert, we've talked to enough people. Roger, we've talked to enough people and they'll tell you, I understand what you're saying. Oh, I know I need to get to church, but I ain't got time. Right? Are you saved? Oh, yeah. You've been baptized? Oh, yeah. You're a member of church? Oh, yeah. Sincere. And, they, and they'll tell you. They'll give you a testimony. But they'll say, hey, listen, but right now, I just don't have time. He even knocked on the door and it was a preacher. Right? And the preacher said, well, I know what you're saying, but I just ain't got time. You know what that is? They've allowed the cares and the riches and the pleasures, the thorns to come up and choke you. A lot of the doors we knock on, there's two to three new cars sitting in the driveway. And you know as well as I do, that's three to four hundred dollar payments each. If not, I see the big trucks, six, seven. I've heard of fifteen hundred dollar a month payments on trucks. And what do you have to do? You got to work. And you've allowed those things that you think are going to bring you pleasure, that you think are going to bring you comfort, that you think is going to bring you uh, glory amongst man's eyes, but in reality, they're thorns and they're thistles that have come up and choked you and your family. You don't got time anymore. And when it comes down to eternity, is it worth it all? Nope. Nope. I remember we were out soul winning with a, a, a preacher. He was a, a retired full bird colonel in the United States Air Force. So he had a good retirement coming in. I knew that. And him and I were out soul winning, and he bought himself. This was a brand new Ford Excursion. How many remember those when those come out on the line? That thing was huge, man. 
this would have been 03 or 04, something like that. I'm telling you, I got in that thing and it was like, oh man, this is nice. I said, I got under it, had heated seats, had an air conditioning seat. He had all the gadgets, and I said, brother, this is nice. And he said, oh, it'll be a, it'll be a bucket of rust one day. And I'm thinking in my mind, this thing ain't, ain't never going to be a bucket of rust. But then I thought, he's right. We'll go in debt. We'll struggle financially. We'll, we're, we are willing to struggle emotionally. We are willing to struggle physically so that we can have something that one day is going to be in the salvage yard. He was right, didn't he? You look at it now 20 years later. What do those excursions look like? Some of y'all are like, I ain't buying one, man. That thing's got engine problems. It's a... Because, and then you say, one of them things drink so much gas. And so if we're not careful, we'll allow the cares and the riches to come up and choke us. So the last thing here, I know I told you last, but I'm still on point number three. I added two within one. So I get a, I get a pass on that one. You see, the soil with weeds, it represents that crowded life. So the question here tonight is, how do we grow in that good ground? Now go with me to verse 15. I'm going to wrap it up. Look what it says in verse 15. But the one, but, but that on the good ground are they, listen to this, which in an honest and what? Good heart. Having heard the word. Then I want you to look at the next two words here. And I want to show you something. What's the next two words? Keep it. That's not what you think it means. Some say, well, that means you've got to hold the salvation and not lose it. That's not what that means. I want to draw your attention when God created Adam. And the Bible said He put him in the garden to what? To dress and keep it. In order for us to grow in that good ground, we've got to cultivate it. We've got to work it. We've got to water it. We've got to keep the weeds and the thorns and the thistles out of it. How many of you had a grandmother? She was always in that garden, weeding that garden. Every day. I used to hear my great-grandma, my great-grandma and grandfather, I was old enough to see them alive. They were born at the turn of the century. Angel's great-grandma was the same way. Angel's great-grandmother, she, she lived the rest of her life as a, as a widow by dressing turkeys and, no, just chickens, right? Chickens for families for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. She'd go out there, she'd kill them, she'd dress them, and have them on people's plates. She had a garden, didn't she? My great grand and, and, and I was old enough to see that generation. And listen, it was every day they were in the garden, weeding the garden. And I would hear my great grandma say, I was just there last night. And that thing popped up again. That weed. Right? And that's what we have to do in our Christian life. Listen to me, church. We got to keep those things out of our life. They're going to creep up, they're going to pop up. They're going to pop up and you don't even notice. But we've got to keep it. We've got to cultivate it. We've got to work that ground. If we don't, what will happen? You won't be resolved to grow. You're not going to be receptive. You're not going to be ruthless with distractions. And we've got to keep it. And let's see what else that verse says here. Not only do you keep it, and the Bible says, and bring forth fruit with what? That's one thing I ain't got. And I hear a big amen all the way in the back. <laughs> Listen to me, I'm wrapping it up. I know it's hard. Do you ever feel sometimes it's just like you're going nowhere in your Christian life? Huh? Yeah. And it's like, Lord, when am I going to bear fruit? Lord, I'm doing this for you and doing that for you, but when am I going to bear fruit? But what's the Bible say? You're to bear fruit with what? 
patience. Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says, run the race with patience. That race that's set before us. When you... Huh? Oh, yeah. Amen. You see, we have to do that with patience. When you're watching that, brother, I'm going to use you as an example. I'm trying to wrap up. But look, look. We planted an olive tree out there, didn't we? And I go out there about every day and I look at that tree. And I read on the internet. Look, the internet's full of information, right? I read on the internet that it will bear fruit in its first year, right? And you know what I'm out there doing? I'm looking for an olive. Every day. And listen, I'm liking that to the Christian life. If we're not careful, we'll get impatient with God. But every day I go out there and say, Phew, I hadn't come yet. And if I'm not careful, I'll, get, I'll, I'll just say, that ain't doing nothing. Get rid of it, burn it, right? But you've got to have patience with it. And in your Christian life, if you want to grow in that good ground... You've got to keep it. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to work it. You've got to exercise it. You've got to be receptive to God. You've got to be resolved to grow. You've got to be ruthless with distractions in your life. And you've got to work it and keep it. And the Bible says you've got to do that with what? A good heart. You know, you know what that means? No fear, no bitterness, no anger, no deception. No doubt. You've got to be resolved to grow. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Why don't we come to the altar? Miss Edna, if you're willing to play, come up here and play for us. Folks, if God's dealing with you about something, hey, this was not only to the new believers, but also to your old believers as well. Amen? Amen. Come up here and play. Y'all have, well, listen, invitation, y'all pray. Uh, if you need to be saved, listen to, talk to Robert. I'm going to go baptize. <laughs> God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me, He died for me, He died for me, He died for me. He's so good to me. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He's so good to me. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. He's so good to me. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Well, the heater didn't heat quick enough. So he's like, we're going to get her done. Amen. And uh, great time, great opportunity to be able to baptize. And what a privilege tonight. Amen. We have an opportunity to baptize. Brad, he got saved and he committed his life to Christ. Amen. So we're gonna, he's going to follow the Lord in believers' baptism. Amen. And I want to say, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes, sir, I have. All right. Upon your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Bury the likeness of His death. Raise in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do you want to say anything? So much weight to lift it off my shoulders after this. Man. It is cold. It is cold. All right. Well, it is done as the master commanded. Yet there is room. Amen. 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 Get out. There's towels down there. Amen. And uh, listen, there's only two people that have taken me under where I've gotten wet in my britches, and he's one of them. So.
The other one was TJ, amen. But uh, anyways, I even baptized Robert. He didn't take me down. But uh, praise the Lord. Cool. Good to. Amen. Praise the Lord. But anyways, it's done as the master's command to get to his room. Amen. All right, we'll go ahead and close out tonight. Robert, would you go ahead and close us out in a word of prayer? Y'all fellowship for a while. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that we got to uh, see Brad get baptized, Lord. And uh, Lord, just uh, thank you, and uh, we're glad that he's a uh, part of the family, Lord. And uh, we're thankful that we got here safe today, and that we got to hear the word, Lord, and we got to... Uh, we got to sing and praise you, Lord, and, and we got to get around each other, Lord, and fellowship, and uh, some dedicate back their lives to you, Lord, and Lord, we just thank you for all the faithful people here, Lord. We thank you uh, for the children here that are learning and, and doing good, and Master's Club, and everybody who's just, just pitching in, Lord. It's, it takes all of us, Lord, and we just thank you for the strength, Lord, and we just thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.